Good evening, and welcome to Full Moon Matinee. I'm your host, The Detective, bringing you the finest crime dramas and film noir from the golden age of Hollywood. And tonight marks a very special occasion. Tonight, I bring you Full Moon Matinee's first ever, and likely only, color movie. Now, in many ways, my hand was forced with this issue. Uh, I could not find a black and white movie that I usually, you know, from the era that I usually bring you, that didn't have copyright issues. And I decided, you know, you can't do Gangster Month without doing a spotlight on this last and most infamous gangster. So, uh, again, my hand was forced, and so here we are. But, to commemorate the occasions of the channel's first ever, and likely only, color movie, and to celebrate the conclusion of Gangster Month, I chose tonight's whiskey as Four Roses. Now, I don't usually do shout-outs to my whiskeys. I have on a couple of rare special occasions, and this is one of them. I don't usually do that because I don't want people to think that this is any kind of a paid promotion or monetized channel. It is not, okay? Just like this idiot message down here says, <laughs> okay? Yeah, but uh, Four Roses has a very special significance to Gangster Month that I will explain in a later segment. And tonight's sixth and final spotlight of Gangster Month is the Big Daddy, the most infamous of all, Al Capone. The picture above is of the real life Al Capone. The picture below is how he's portrayed in tonight's picture by Jason Robards. And tonight's picture is from 1967, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, starring Jason Robards, George Segal, and Ralph Meeker. Now, the picture here, uh, it does give a lot of biographical details. Uh, it, they do it through using voiceovers, you know, describing the, the various gang members uh, and the roles that they served in the gang. Uh, and it also depicts a few other scenes as well. But the storyline is largely focused on Al Capone's most signature infamous event, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre that occurred on Valentine's Day in 1929. So, from 1967, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Let's roll the picture. February 14, 1929, the year of the Black Bottom, six-day bicycle races, flagpole sitting, and the first flight from Paris to New York. Mickey Mouse makes his screen debut, and Herbert Hoover is inaugurated as the 31st president with the words, we in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in any land. Six months later, the New York stock market will crash and bring about the greatest depression in world history. In the city of Chicago, the time is 10.25 a.m. The temperature, 18 above zero.
my god. My god. Following the passage of the National Prohibition Act of 1920, the nation's underworld rises to power and battles amongst itself, just as modern nations and corporations do. Open periods of gang warfare are followed by peace treaties and attempts at consolidation and monopoly, each of which is shattered as new warfare erupts in quest of the booming bootlegging and vice profits. By 1929, the gangs of Chicago operate 21,207 speakeasies, and their gross income reaches $357 million. 618 members of the city's underworld are murdered within nine years. Corruption extends from the mayor's office to the humblest side street speakeasy. Tell your lousy sister to keep my lousy mouth shut. Do me a favor, will you? I mean, just to give her tonsils a break. Two beers. Nice place you got here. Thanks. Doing nice business, huh? Pays the rent. What are you trying to do, poison me? You don't like the beer, mister. You don't have to pay for it. Well, now, ain't you the cat's pajamas? You hear that, Jimmy? Bright Eyes here says we don't have to pay for this slump. How about it, bud? You're drinking this stuff. Tastes terrible, don't it? Guess I'm not what you'd call much of a judge. What's the matter? Don't you know when something stinks? I guess I drunk better at that. Ah, uh, you hear that? Even your friend don't like it. What more do you want? All right, bright eyes, where are you getting it? A fellow named Slauson. Slauson, Slauson. Only Slauson I know works for Capone. Al Capone. That wouldn't be the same Slauson, would it? Huh? I think it is. How much you move in a week? Five barrels. Five? A swell joint like you got here? With the right kind of beer, you could double that easy. I'm gonna put ten barrels in here tomorrow morning, cost you 55 a barrel. Look, mister, you trying to get me knocked off? I can't buck Capone. Neither can Moran. Moran? Only Moran I know drives a streetcar. That, uh... That wouldn't be the same Moran, would it? My mistake. Oh, that's okay. Anybody can make a mistake. Take me. Why, I could even be wrong about your beer. Maybe it's swell, and it's just you got dirty pipes. Happens. <laughs> Well, now, you know what you got there, Bright Eyes. It's not the pipes at all. It's uh, green beer. Hey, you can smell it. See what I mean? Peter Gusenberg, born Chicago, Illinois, September 22nd, 1898. Ex-convict, mail robber, burglar, hijacker, professional killer. 
when at the age of 13 he came home from school to find his mother dead. His first act was to pry the wedding ring from her finger and pawn it. He has been a member of Bugs Moran's Northside Gang for the past seven years. Ten barrels starting tomorrow. And don't forget, I'm doing you a big favor. Frank Gusenberg, younger brother of Peter Gusenberg. Born Chicago, Illinois, October 11, 1902. Burglar, car thief, extortionist, professional gunman. Member of the Northside Gang for the past nine years. He is married to two women simultaneously, but lives with neither. Vincenzo de Mora, alias Machine Gun Jack McGurn. Born Brooklyn, New York, July 7, 1903. When he was nine years old, his father was murdered. By the time he was 20, he had personally killed every man connected with his father's death. He has recently become a top trigger man and extortionist in the Capone organization. Just where the hell were you? Nothing I could do, Jack. I came up like right out of the woodwork. First I know the door is open and he's blasting away. Make him? Yeah. One of Moran's boys, Frank Gusenberg. Alfonso Capone, alias Al Capone, alias Al Brown, born Castellamara, Italy, January 6, 1899. No criminal record. Raised in a Brooklyn slum, he has migrated to Illinois early in 1919. Shrewd, ambitious, and utterly ruthless, Capone in six short years has climbed from the status of saloon bouncer to become unchallenged leader of Chicago's most powerful underworld organization. To his associates, he is the big fellow. To the public, he is Scarface Al Capone. Thank you, Mr. Capone. Sorry about that raid, Jake. It so happens I got a new captain out there. Won't play ball. What's wrong with him? Playing hard to get. We had him put down for a yard a week. He says if we want to operate in his district, we got to triple that. Three hundred, huh? Those guys must think we're made of money. Write me out his name. I'll have the bump transferred to the sticks. It helps get him reelected. Half a million in Thompson campaign funds a bargain. I put Cermak in the mayor's office, and we're going to lose. 20 million a year. That's a waste of dough. We bought one of them. He loses out, we buy the next one. You don't know Tony Cermak, Frank. Charles the Fixer Fischetti, born Castellamara, Italy, August 11, 1891. A second cousin to Al Capone, Fischetti acts as chairman at executive meetings. He is a heavy drinker, but never drunk. His principal value to the organization is his ability to suborn political leaders and public officials on both state and city levels. He will be murdered on April 7, 1951. And that's where we can get hurt. He ever tries chiseling on a big fella's rackets, he'll think a suitcase fell out. Oh, come on, Frank, you know. Hello, Al.
Meeting will come to order. Jack. Jack, we got you down here for a report on the stockyards district. How's everything going down there? I'll read you the figures and let you tell me. Okay? We took over that territory from Joe Saltis at the end of last October. And right away, things got better. For example, beer sales for the 30-day period ending December 15 are up 21.4... Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik, born Peoria, Illinois, November 9, 1894. A one-time proprietor of a string of suburban houses of prostitution. Guzik is now in charge of all bootlegging sales and distribution for the Capone Syndicate. He will die of natural causes on July 11, 1956. <laughs> I've been telling you guys for months that when it comes to selling beer, that big Polak don't know his hat from third base. <laughs> for Christ's sake. All I get out of you guys is talk. The rest of the time, you're strutting around with dollar cigars and you're kissing like a bunch of bankers. <laughs> big shots. Well, what's wrong, Al? What's wrong? You guys uh, just get off the boat or something? Huh? Am I the only guy around here who knows what's going on in this town? Now, let me give you some real facts. Not the kind of loving kisses we've been getting from our good pal Jake here. Nobody has to tell me we're making money out in the stockyards or any place else on the south side or the west side. But what about the north side, Jake? I don't hear no nice fat figures on that. Or maybe you figure that into town ain't worth holding on to. We talked about this, Al. Yeah, we talked about it. You talked about it! Well, no trouble, Al. Forget about it, Al. Fucking range is showing off, Al. Now that's what I think of your figures, Jake. Now you're gonna get some of my figures. Since Labor Day, Bugs Moran's Bugs push our bill out of 28, 28 joints South Chicago Avenue alone. That don't sound like much, does it? Not 28 joints. What's 28 joints out of 12,000 peanuts, right? Right? Uh, Al, if you just listen to reason. Shut up! Shut it right now! I'm doing the talking! Now, there's something else. Take our pal Jack McGurn here. Now, Jack's a nice fella. Does as he's told. He keeps his nose clean. I wish I had a couple of hundred like him. So what happens here? A month ago, damned about... Punk of Moran's don't up and turn a chopper loose on him. Tony Lombardo. My pal Tony. Went to his funeral. I cried at his funeral. I bawled like a baby. Here's a guy never carried a gun in his whole life. Middle of the loop. 4.30 in the afternoon. Two slugs through the back of the head, put there by a couple of Bugs Moran's red hots. Now, Al, now, now, just think a minute, huh? I mean, going after Moran, it, it just ain't good business. Business? I'm talking about staying alive. Try getting it through your cement head that what Moran's pulled so far, that's just for openers. He wants me. He wants me dead. The way Dee and Abandon wanted me dead. The way Jaime Weiss wanted me dead. Right down there on 22nd Street. Middle of the day. Damn it, that crazy Polak don't come looking for me with a whole army.
That was Jaime Weiss for you. And right now, Moran's getting set to pull something just as crazy. Well, the hell with that! We're gonna get him before he gets me. I want that Irish son of a bitch. Hit. All right, Al. You want him more on a hit? We hit him. Of course, it's gonna take a little time. And... All right, now, wait a minute. All right, Al, you're sore, huh? Okay, nobody's saying you haven't got a right to be sore. But now, you, you remember... You want to argue with me, Charlie? Work it out, Frank. Only make it quick. Quick? I don't know. To tell the truth, Al, there's a whole lot about the guy we don't know to begin with. Francesco Nittoni, alias Frank the Enforcer Nitty. Born Montadoro, Sicily, January 9, 1887. Nitty is in charge of the Capone Organization's Punishment Squad, made up of accomplished strong-arm men and professional killers. On March 19, 1943, while under indictment for income tax evasion, Nitty will use a gun for the last time to take his own life. Before we could take the chance to put him on a spot at all. So... I don't want to hear all that. Everybody wants to argue. I told you what to do. How long is it going to take? I don't know what to tell you. Honest, I don't. Like I told you, we got I nothing to go I can't hear you, Frank. Five weeks. Six at the most. Six weeks? <laughs> what are you going to use on him, a bow and arrow? Something on your mind, Jack? Well, uh... Yes, sir. Maybe I'm wrong to butt in like this. But the last couple of months, I've been doing a little checking up on Moran. He lives at the Belden Essex Apartments on Lincoln Park West. Apartment 5C. Uses the name George Miller. He's crazy about his wife and kid. He stays home most nights. Never goes anywhere without two torpedoes, Willie Marks and Ted Newberry. Both bad guys to tangle with. If that's any help, Mr. Capone. <laughs> you left something out, Jack, where he buys his PVDs. <laughs> I said I wish I had a couple of hundred like him. Now you know why. <coughs> Come here, Jack. You want to know something, Jack? I like a guy who can use his head for something beside a hat rack. And seeing as how you know so much about Moran, I'm giving you the job of getting rid of him. If that's okay with you, Frank. I got no objections. Think you can handle it, kid? Yes, sir. There's just one thing, Mr. Capone. We may have to take some of Moran's boys with him. I'll send flowers. <laughs> I'm not scared of a war with Capone. It's gonna be him or me. If he'd stuck to his word these past couple of years, it'd be a different story. But every deal he's made, he's broken. O'Banion thought he could deal with him. Our wife did, too. Well, I don't have to tell you how they ended up. George Clarence Moran. Born St. Paul, Minnesota, July 9, 1893. Ex-convict, burglar, horse thief, hijacker, suspected killer, present leader of Chicago's notorious and long-established Northside mob, which during the past five years has been almost constantly at war with the Capone organization for control of the city's bootlegging and gambling profits. During these five years, every previous leader of the Northside gang has been murdered by the Capone interests. Jaime shook the dirty hand of that rotten grease ball. Oh, sure, sure. We've been giving him a lot of trouble lately. But I'm telling you here and now, that's not enough. Not when you figure what he's been doing to us. Pushing his slop in our saloons, hijacking our trucks, and sending punks like that Jack McGurn up here to snoop around. Well, that may be Jake with you guys, but not me. I say it's time we put Al Capone and his bums out of business. For good! George! With what? You can start a war with Capone, but you're not going to win it. 
Not when every wop in town is working for him. I know some that aren't. Joe Yellow's mob. That five and dime puck? A pawn don't even know he's alive. Jimmy, that's no way to talk about our new partner. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this, some kind of rib? Sit down, Frank. Since when do we hook up with a bunch of crummy spicks? You can count me out. Don't you pop off to me, you stupid trout. When it comes to getting Capone, I don't care who I use. Do you remember Dini O'Banion? Remember Jaime Weiss? Well, you ought to because you helped load their coffins into the hearse. Or maybe when a friend of yours is gone, you don't give a damn no more. Well, I do. And Dini O'Banion was my friend, and I don't forget him. And I don't forget who had him knocked off. Jaime Weiss and me, we was with Dini not ten minutes before they got him. Now remember those grease balls. They just as soon put a bullet in your back as eat a pizza. To hell with them Sicilians. Be seeing you, Jaime. Morning, Johnny. Ah, good morning, boys. That's the way Capone operates. That's the murdering double crosser who swore up and down he'd keep the hell out of the north side. Well, I'm not waiting around for Capone to put me in no cemetery. We nail him before he nails me. All right, let's nail him to get it over with. Did you say we do it without the help of a two bit spaghetti snapper like Joe Yellow? Frank, you're a dummy, you know that. Capone's protection comes from the mafia. He can't make a move without permission of the head wop. And he can't be the head himself because he's not Sicilian. So he's got his own man, Patsy Lalorda, running the outfit. Now, your spaghetti snapper, Joe Yellow, is a pal of Lalordo's. He helps us knock over Lalordo, then he takes over the mafia. And that's when we take old Scarface for a nice one-way ride. And if it don't work, he'll take us for a ride. Well, it better work because I'm putting you in charge. Well, I'm not saying it cannot be done, especially if our yellow gets us in there. Albert R. Kachelik, alias James Clark. Born Kreyunka, Germany, February 25, 1888. Ex-convict, burglar, car thief, suspected killer. Since marrying Bugs Moran's sister five years ago, he has become the number two man in the Moran gang. And then we need a good driver for the getaway car. I don't care how you do it. Just get rid of Patsy Lelordo. Quick. I learned how to drive when I was young. Because... John May, born Chicago, Illinois, September 28, 1897. Married, seven children. Twice arrested on charges of safe blowing and burglary. No convictions. Has worked occasionally for the Moran gang as an auto mechanic. He has promised his wife he will stay out of further trouble with the law, but he is three months behind in the rent. I'd really like to help you out, Mr. Clark. It's just that I don't... Up to you, Johnny. You want to do us a favor? Fine. 
If you don't, that's your lookout. Here, see? Well, I'm not really a trigger man, you see. As a matter of fact, I don't even own a gun. And if there were any shooting to start, I'd... Well, I'd tell the cock-out world it won't be you. Think we want some lousy amateur gumming up the works? Why, I wouldn't even let you kill my own mother. The Gusenbergs will do their shooting, Johnny. All I'm asking you to do is drive the car. That and maybe use a little muscle if things get rough. Pays a hundred bucks. Now, are you in? Oh, out. It's a hundred bucks for the whole job? Uh-huh. I'll do it. Besides, I really need the money. Nicholas Sorello, born Marsala, Sicily, May 13, 1872. Brought to the United States by his cousin Dominic Ferenza when in his late 30s. Married with five children and 11 grandchildren. He has had difficulty learning the ways of the new world and has lived in continual poverty. He will be murdered on February 15, 1929, less than 24 hours after completion of the only criminal activity of his life. Mr. McGurn, I'm a Nick Sorella. Sit down, Nick. Want a drink? Something to eat? Thank you, no. It is a kind of you to ask. Dominic Ferenza says you're a man can be trusted. Maybe that is because my memory, it is very bad. <laughs> what do you do for a living, Nick? I have the truck. Sometimes I'm selling the vegetables. Sometimes I'm in the moving business. It's very hard to get a good job when you talk with accent. Yeah. Any trouble with the cops? No. One time, yes. They tell me I'm moving the uh, stolen goods. I say I do not know this. They take what is in my truck. They let me go. It's same thing as in old country. It's no different here. <laughs> Got a job for you, Nick. Bring it off, you get paid big. 500 bucks. It honors me to serve you, Mr. Magana. You're gonna need a couple paisani. Guys that can keep their traps shut. Sometime tonight, there'll be a car left in front of your house. It'll be hot, so ditch it soon as the job's finished. Got that? Write this down. Tomorrow morning, nine on the nose, you and your boys be on 33rd Street, half a block west of Roby. You're gonna need a gun. Gun? That is something I do not have, Mr. McGon. Guns make trouble. Okay. 
okay. Cops. I just seen a hijack being pulled up. Johnny and me got our end of a down pat. Now all we need to know is. Yeah. Mr. Moran, is Nick Sorello. Uh, Mr. Sorello, I don't think I know you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what label? Uh huh. How much are you asking? I uh, suppose you call me back in an hour and a half. Yeah, do that. What was all that about? A guy named Sorrell. He's got 80 odd cases, old log cabin he wants to pedal. 56 bucks a case. Price seems all right. Yeah, but is he all right? Monroe, 8099, please. <clears throat> a Lieutenant Zalacosta, please. Oh, hello, Larry. This is George. Now, look, Larry, a couple of things. Let me know if your boy's got anything on a booze hijack last couple of days. Out near the stockyards. All right. And and while you're at it, see if you got a make sheet on a wop named Nick Cirillo. Right. I'll call you back in about an hour, okay? Thanks, Larry. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. What were you saying? Oh, just that we're about ready to make our move. All we need now is to make sure Lulorda's bodyguards train shifts the same time every day. I've got a couple of boys checking on that right now. Alfonso, carissimo. Pasqualino. Guarda il cuore. A viderte, Pasqualino. Come in, come in. Salute e vita durevole. Altrettanto. Grazie. Betsy, uh, Bugs Moran's been stepping out of line. I've uh, told the voice to go ahead and fix his wagon. This I do not like to hear, Alphonse. Maybe if you would talk things over? Talk hell! I talked to O'Banion and he laughed at me. I talked to Weiss. I pleaded with Weiss. Three times he tried to have me bumped off. Now, Moran is just as bullheaded. You can't talk any sense to these peasants. Every time I try it, I wind up getting shot at. I'm not asking you, Patsy. I'm telling you. I'm getting rid of Moran. Così sia, compadre. You and I, we will not quarrel over the life of a worthless man. I'm letting Jack McGurn handle it. He wants two mafia boys on the choppers, Scalisi and Anselmo. Same dough we paid for knocking off Jaime Weiss, okay? As you wish, my friend. Alfonso, something else troubles you, no? Yeah. I've been here, thanks, Patsy. You know how it is, yeah. You pick up a word here and a word there, you put them together, and pretty soon you got a picture. Maybe it's on a level and maybe it ain't. The way I get it, Joe Aiello is going to take over the mafia in this town and they got your name on a bullet. 
I have nothing to fear from Aiello. Don Giuseppe and I are as brothers. We attended the university in Palermo together. We came to this country only months apart. We are both members of the Inner Council of the Brotherhood. No, Alfonso. I thank you very much for your concern for me. But what you have heard is not true. I know this. It's a Nick Sorello. Get it. Catch it! What's she got out there, Nick? Is it just a couple of two of my good friends? They come help for me to. Get them in here. And Mario! Joe! Avanti! Come on, come on. Come on. What did you have in mind, Nick? I ask you, Pad, senor. It's only to watch the whiskey I have with a gun. No! You're a very naughty boy, Nick. All right, let's get it in here. Dr. Reinhardt H. Schwimmer, born Chicago, Illinois, December 1, 1896. Twice married, twice divorced. Schwimmer has no criminal record, but is one of that group of men who are fascinated by the exploits of gangsters. In the last few months, he has become acquainted with the members of the Moran organization and spends a good deal of time in their company. A licensed optometrist, he has recently abandoned his practice and is presently supported by his widowed mother. Okay, Nick, get it unloaded. The money. The signore. First, you pay me the money. Don't worry about it, Nick. We'll send you a check. <laughs> you pardon the signore. Oh. Myself, I talk to Mr. Moran on the telephone. He say, okay, Nick, I pay you the cash. Fifty-six dollars a case for the first class stuff. Hey, you taste, eh? Is the first class stuff, no? Okay. Now you pay me the money. We take him off of the truck. Where'd you get it, Nick? Mr. Moran, he don't say that. He just to say. Little hijack job, eh, Nick? Got it off a of dingbat Alberta's boys, right? Oh. Uh, we hear these things, Nick. You don't pay the dingbat, we don't pay you. That's fair. Okay, move it. You'll get your dough. Move. Oh. Adam Heyer, born Springfield, Illinois, June 26, 1881. Criminal record, one conviction for operating a confidence game. Married twice, one child, a son by his first wife. As a qualified accountant, Heyer acts as bookkeeper and collector for the Moran organization, as well as handling payoffs to local politicians and the police. His wife has been ill for several years, and he is careful to conceal the true nature of his business from her and from their friends. They're all here, Mr. Gutenberg. Nick? Stuff checks out. All our cabin uncut. How many cases? It's eight or two. Myself, I counted them. Nick wouldn't lie to us. He wants to stay healthy. 
Ain't that right, Nick? That's 82 cases. $56 a case. That figures $4,592. One thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand. One, two, three, four, five. We'll make it uh, even money. Forty-five hundred dollars. Five hundred for handling charges, Nick. When we help unload a truck, we get paid. Check. Thousand thanks, signore. Maybe we do it the business uh, again uh, some more no, next time. Yeah. I think we like better than doing business with Bright Boy. <laughs> You're my idea of a Bright Boy. <laughs> yeah. Bigger shot. Some of the money, they steal it back from me. More than $500. I figured they would. In fact, I counted on it. You got one more job to do. Just when, I don't know yet. A real easy job, Nick. Just one simple phone call. Now remember, Pete, Frank will pick you up tomorrow afternoon at 3.30 sharp. At exactly 10 to 4, both of your pickup draw are yellow on the corner of Wharton and Polina. Now, the three of you got to be upstairs and in your lawyer's apartment at 524 on the nose. You got all that? Don't worry about me. I can handle my end. You better do your worrying about a yellow. I think he's all right. But if something goes wrong, I'm counting on you, Pete. See you. As Mr. and Mrs. Peter J. Gorman, Peter Gusenberg, and an ex-showgirl named Myrtle Nelson Koppelman have occupied apartment 5C at 434 Roscoe Street, for the past seven months. They're reading that thing all night. You made me lose my place. Yeah? Come on over here, I'll find it for you. What are you eating? What's it look like I'm eating? Damn it. Well, you could have made one for me. What's the matter? You bust a leg or something? You know that coat you got me for Christmas? You told me I could exchange it because it was too big? So what? Well, I did this afternoon for a nicer one. Nicer? What do you mean, nicer? That coat sent me back 750 smackers. Oh, I know it did, Pete. You've been awful good to me. And don't you think for one minute I don't appreciate it. It's just, well, this one I couldn't resist, that's all. I know. You just sit right there. I'll go put it on for you. You'll see how nice it looks. Yowza, yowza, yowza. This is Ben, Bernie, and all the lads coming to you from the college inn of the Hotel Sherman. And now for all you lads and lassies listening in the great Midwest, we're going to play stumbling. Let's stumble a bit, laddies. Isn't it beautiful, Pete? How much? You don't have to use that tone of voice. How much? It was a bargain, baby. They marked it way down low. I just knew you'd want me... Three thousand, that's all. Three grand! 
Why, you lousy little gold digger, when I picked you out of the line, all you had in your name was a cloth coat with monkey fur on the collar. Well, it goes back tomorrow, you hear me? Back! Listen, you cheap gangster. I'm gonna kick... Let me uh, Chief Gangster! I'm gonna call the When interviewed by the press some weeks later, Myrtle Koppelman had this to say. Oh, Pete and I have been married about a year. I can't remember exactly where we were married, except that it wasn't in Illinois. Well, I had no idea Pete was a gangster. He said he was a salesman. Truly a kinder, more gentle man. Well, you just couldn't meet one. Hello again. Now, as the various characters were being introduced by the voiceovers, most of their dates and places of birth were fictionalized, for whatever reason I don't know. Uh, I'm going to give just a couple of examples. One of them, <laughs> surprisingly, was on the main character, Al Capone. The voiceover said he was born in Italy, he was not. Al Capone was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Another one that was off uh, was Jake Guzik. Uh, he was the gang's paymaster and bagman. The voiceover said he was born in Peoria in 1894. No, he was born in 1896 in Krakow, Poland. And Almost all of the others were off in the same way, but those are just petty details that had no real bearing on the historical events as they occurred. So I'm not going to rattle through the whole list, but I wanted to give a couple examples just to show. Except for one, um, and one I want to hit this one, was the character we saw, Patsy Lillardo. Uh, we saw him shortly ago. He was the one that Al went to go visit in his apartment. He was the older guy, you know, with the salt and pepper hair, wearing that red smoking jacket with the paisley print. Um, there was no Patsy Lillardo. This character seems to be a hybrid composite of two real people, Johnny Torrio and Antonio Lombardo. Johnny Torrio was Al Capone's mentor. This was back when they were in Brooklyn. Johnny Torrio was the one who kind of brought Al Capone up through the ranks. But when, after Prohibition went into effect, Torrio went to Chicago, established the bootlegging operation, and quickly sent for Al Capone to come and help. So that's how they both ended up uh, in Chicago. 
uh, Torio was Al's mentor, which certainly explains why here in the in the film, Al was so respectful and deferential toward him. You know, in a way that he isn't with anyone else, but he would have been to his mentor, Johnny Torio. The other character this is this composite is a part of is Antonio Lombardo. Antonio Lombardo was Capone's, he was Capone's conciliare. Uh, it's an Italian word. It means advisor or counselor. A conciliare in, in a mafia family is a very trusted, prestigious position because the conciliare is the one guy in the gang who can give some lip and talk back to the Don, to the head of the family, okay? And that is because in order for the Don to be able to trust his advice and, and know that he's getting objective opinions, uh, the Don more or less has to protect his life and safety. He's guaranteed. He won't be punished for anything he says or get bumped off. It, none of that. So that is guaranteed so that the Don knows he's getting, you know, the most objective advice. So yeah, this Patsy Lillardo seems to be a composite of the two. Johnny Torrio and Antonio Lombardo. Now, this gets really confusing. Antonio Lombardo did have a bodyguard whose last name was Lollardo. I know, they're, they're similar. And uh, Lombardo, Lollardo. But that's probably where they got the last name to fictionalize it for this character. But other than little things, uh, you know, the, the dates and places of birth, but in showing what the gang members did, the roles they played, uh, their histories, uh, the sequence of events as they occurred. This is generally spot on, and I'm very pleased. So, I want to get back, I promised you. So why four roses tonight? If you went back to the era before Prohibition, four roses was a very common, very popular bourbon whiskey in the days before Prohibition. And it was in the immediate years after Prohibition. In a way that we think of Jack Daniels or Jim Beam as being big, huge names in bourbon today, such was Four Roses for this era. Simply put, Four Roses was the Jack Daniels or Jim Beam of this day. So that's why I picked it tonight. It was a perfect bourbon whiskey to celebrate Gangster Month. So that's why we have it. Um, it's a strange thing though. Uh, it, it was popular you know, when Prohibition was lifted. The company was purchased in 1943 by Seagram's Whiskey. It was sometime in the late 1950s, they made the very curious business decision to remove its sale from the U.S. and it was focused exclusively on Canada and its overseas export markets. And that was for many years, actually decades really. Now, in the interim time, they did make a label that they sold in the, F in the U.S. that they called Four Roses, but it was a, a very inexpensive blended whiskey, not the straight bourbon that it used to be. And honestly, in that interim time, it was kind of a, kind of a bottom shelf whiskey. But it was after 1995, they brought it back for sale in the U.S. and brought it back as a straight bourbon again, and it has been making its way back ever since. So let's get back to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. On January 7th, the Moran Gang puts into effect its plan to murder Mafia Chieftain Patsy Lalordo. 
The first step is for Pete and Frank Gusenberg to use Joe Aiello's friendship for Lalardo as a means to enter his apartment. Your name, Aiello? Aiello. Hop in. One thing I gotta know, Aiello, you're positive this guy Lalardo ain't setting us up for a double cross. Don Pasqualino and I are just like blood brothers. He truly believes we are calling on him on a business matter. The man who got him will know this, so they will allow us to enter. Gabish. Get it. Take it easy, Elio. The second step of the plan to murder Patsy Lalordo is the systematic elimination of his bodyguards. Caro Don Giuseppe, alla salute. Alla tua. Pasqualino, che è successo? Ah! Dio mio! Ah! Mio marito è ammazzato! Aiuto! Pasqualino, rispondimi, mio bene! Mio! Tesoro! Trouble with this country today is its morals are all shot. I mean, look at the young people. Girls, smoking cigarettes right out in the streets. And nicking in the back seat of a car and wearing skirts so short you can see everything they got. And fellas, packing a hip flask full of rot gut whiskey. Driving around half drunk. You're perfectly right, Mr. Capone. I see them in my courtroom every day. Drunk, disorderly, defiant. I hardly know how to handle them. What these kids need, Your Honor, is a good working over with a razor strap on their bare behind. Boys and girls. If any kid in my... Excuse me, Your Honor. Fresh up your drinks, folks. I'll be right back. so important. You got it.
What is it, Al? <sighs> What's wrong? Patsy Lillardo. He's dead. Murder him! In his own house! Shot him! His friend! Traditore! Carogna! Che lui! I figli! E i figli dei! I figli! Now this people... Marcino nell'inferno! Oh. Per un milione d'anni! All right. Who killed him? Three men. Two of Moran's punks. And Giuseppe Aiello. Aiello? Yeah. What was it you were saying, Charlie? Talk to Moran. Pay the guy to lay off. Give the poor guy a pass. Now listen, uh, let me tell you something. I came not close to saying, maybe you're right for the first time in your life. But no more, Charlie. Moran goes. And so does Aiello. Him, I take care of. You see that? Like an old man. I tell you, the Union's out to get me. They already made one try. They came at me with a shotgun. Next time, shoot a couple back at him. I'm not a gunman, George. I just wasn't cut out to be a well, gunman. Well, what were you cut out for? To sell neckties? Listen, you're in the rackets, brother. Same as the rest of us. And the kind of dough I'm paying you, you either fight back or get out altogether. I thought maybe I could run one of your speaks for you. Now, that's my real line. You know I'm good at it. I've got no job for saloon keepers. I don't know when I will have. Either you keep the job you've got or... Albert Weinschenker, alias Albert Weinschenk. Born Chicago, Illinois, December 23, 1893. No criminal record. Although Weinshank is not a gangster in the usual sense of the word, he has been associated with the North Side mob for the past three years. First as an operator of speakeasies, now in charge of a non-union cleaning and dyeing association controlled by Bugs Moran. Well, Bert, I know it isn't easy for you, but you do a good job for me, and I'd sure hate to lose you. So why don't you go back home and give it some more thought? Talk it over with Irene again. I'll be at the Clark Street garage Thursday between 10 and 10.30. Stop by and let me know one way or the other. I'll do that. If I could just get Irene to quit being so nervous, but... Well, you know how women are. Yeah. I can't thank you enough, George. Forget it. We're old pals, remember? Hello. Mr. Moran, it's Nick Sorello. You remember me? Yeah, I remember you, Nick. What about it? Maybe pretty soon I get some more. Same stuff like before, same price, okay? Yeah, I guess we could work something out. How big a load? Uh, this I'm not sure. I do not have delivery yet. <laughs> you understand, Mr. Moran? Yeah, I understand. How soon do you think it'll be? Maybe tomorrow. Or maybe uh, two days. Okay, call us when you're ready. I'll have the boys take delivery. Uh, Mr. Moran, is one thing... Last time, you boys, they push me around a little bit. This time, I do a business with you, okay. But with you boys, no. Okay, make it this Thursday morning around 10.30, same place. I'll be there myself. I guarantee you'll get everything that's coming to you. That's fine. Uh, to meet with you is my pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran. <laughs> well, why don't you step down here? I have a beautiful little style I think you'd like. It has a hot water heater, safety glass, ventilated crankcase, the best self starter on the market at only 16,000 miles. A lot of pep and zing in this, baby. I don't know. Used car and all. Ah, but I use LaSalle, sir. That's the big difference. I'll let you in on a little something. Belong to a Cook County commissioner. And I don't have to tell you how those boys take care of their cars. How much? $800. But for you, $750. Sold. Provided I can drive around here right now. Don't see why not. How'd you like to finance it? Oh, uh, cash on the line. That's okay. Yes, sir. 
Can't argue with cash. All I need is your name and address for the bill of sale. Oh, yeah. Uh, James Morton, 212 Hubbard Street, Los Angeles, California. Four months in advance. Yes, sir, you betcha. I'll get you a receipt for this, Mr. Uh... Uh, James Morton. Oh, I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Morton. On the evening of February 11, Angelo Molina, a second cousin of Joe Aiello's, buys a train ticket to Los Angeles. Aware that Al Capone has discovered his part in the murder of Patsy Lalordo, Aiello will use the ticket to board the train at the last minute in an effort to escape the vengeance of Capone. Who's says people are getting fed up? Papers? These guys on the radio, what do they know? Think most guys give a damn who gets bumped off as long as it ain't them? Listen, I know people. I'm making my business to know people. They get a big kick reading in the paper where some poor stiff gets taken for a ride. Hello? Yeah, Frank? Wait for me. At the barber shop. Come on, kid. Stick around, guys. I gotta go pay a bill. Due uomini, ravengiatori, ma se si dà! Assassino! Ma se si dà! Gira!
Mrs. Duty, my friend here and me, we're looking for a nice front room. And your sign up there. Come on, Ann. I can't afford to heat up the whole street. The way they charge for coal nowadays. Yes. You in a band or something? With an orchestra. One of the cabarets over on Fullerton. The rooms are upstairs. Okay. Oh, this is a charming place you have here, Mrs. Duty. I don't want no horn tooting in here. My rumors wouldn't stand for nothing like that. <laughs> don't you worry about that, ma'am. We only play these things when we get paid for it. Do you want two singles or just the double? One room's enough, as long as it's a front. If you're going to be sleeping days, I'd advise you to take a back room. The noise on Clark Street isn't to be believed, what with the buses and the people. I said a front room, okay? You see, we're out here from New York, man. It gets too quiet, we can't go to sleep. Bet you're the same way. I'll show you what I got. Nice room, Mrs. Duty. We'll take it. You get a change of linen twice a week. Bathroom's at the end of the hall. No visitors after 11. And I don't want no women up here. I run a respectable place. Well, don't I... you worry about that, ma'am. We'll move our stuff in tomorrow. How much do we owe you? Comes to $9 a week. In advance. Your receipt and an extra key will be on the hall table. What's your name? Well, he's Mr. White, and I'm Mr. Johnson. Hey, lady, what about a phone? Pay phone at the end of the hall. You better give Vic a call. Right. Long Beach, 6599. Filling station, O'Mara talking. Yeah, hold on. He just stepped out. Any message? I'll call him back. Okay. Who just stepped out? Wrong number. Okay. Okay. I've been here before, you know. Thought I recognized you. That'll be two dollars a piece. All right. Cars in a garage behind 1723 Wood Street. Right here. Opens onto an alley running north and south. Take the alley to Bloomingdale and jog left to Wood. East on Webster to Clark, south on Clark Street about half a block, and there she is. Since you boys come from out of town, nobody in the place is going to recognize you. All you got to do is act like cops. Huh. Must be yours. That's Moran. You probably won't be able to see his face from across the street, but none of his boys are built like him, so that's no problem. He wears brown clothes a lot. Suit, overcoat, hat, shoes. 
Albert Anselmi, born Marsala, Sicily, June 11, 1892. He is a member of the Mafia and a professional assassin, as is John Scalisi, born Castelvetrano, Sicily, January 24, 1895. In a period of less than six years, these two men acting together have participated in 31 murders, including those of Dean O'Banion and Earl Jaime Weiss. There's always the outside chance you'll be spotted by a legit squad car. If it happens before you get there and they try to stop you, okay. That's a rap the lawyers can beat. If it happens after you leave, you might as well start blasting. You got nothing to lose. Any questions? That's it. Great to hear from you, kid. How's the weather back there? Right around zero, Mr. Capone. <laughs> sure could use some of that Miami sunshine up here. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet you could. <laughs> Anything uh, special you want to tell me, kid? Yes, sir. It's all set for this Thursday, Mr. Capone. In the morning, around 10.30. We got a nice valentine all ready to deliver. Valentine. Hey, that's right. This Thursday's Valentine's Day. <laughs> Ain't that a hard one? A Valentine for a bug. Say, Jack, just make sure it's a great big red Valentine. Huh? <laughs> At 6.45 on the last morning of his life, John May takes an early bus to work. He has been promised a $10 bonus if he can replace the transmission of one of the gang's cars before noon. At 7.02 on the last morning of his life, Pete Gusenberg is considering ways to rid himself of Myrtle Koppelman. There are plenty more where she came from. At 7.23 on the last morning of his life, Albert Kocelek, alias James Clark, is thinking of buying a new car. His status in the gang demands better than this. Uh, you should have woke me, Ma. I'd have had breakfast with you. How do you expect me to know you were even home? Coming in at all hours. You said you would be here for supper. I'm sorry, Ma. I ran into a couple of friends. <laughs> I might have guessed. Where those friends of yours are concerned, you don't have a mother. At 7.30 on the last morning of his life, Reinhard Schwimmer is in desperate need of money. I have to talk to you, Mama. It's important. Listen, Mama, I hate to tell you this, but I'm in trouble. Not with the police, Reinhard. Nothing like that. I owe some money. $300. It's got to be paid quick or I'm in a real jam. Ich verstehe dich nicht, Reinhard. A man with a fine profession. Doing such things. All right. If you promise to stay away from those gangsters, I'll get you the money. I will. I give you my word. Just be a good boy, Rana. That isn't so much to ask. Hello. What do you want? Is what? Oh, Eddie. Yeah, I'm up. Yeah, Eddie, I'm up. I'm up. I'm up. I'm up. I'm up. What's your hurry, honey? You think I like sitting around here and listening to you snore? Stick around, hot stuff. We'll open a keg of nails.
Mr. still here. Look, mister, you owe me $25. And I don't leave until I get it. You know, with a he-man like me, you ought to pay. That'll be the day. Well, thanks, lover. See you around. At 7.41 on the last morning of his life, Frank Gusenberg is wondering if he shouldn't go back to one of his wives. Can I fix you some breakfast, dear? At 8 o'clock on the last morning of his life, Adam Heyer is calculating how much the cost of an operation for his wife will take from his savings. You won't back down, promise me. Look, don't worry, honey, I'm through. I walk in and say, so long, George, I won't be seen anymore, and walk out. Finish. Thank God. I'll call you after lunch, around 1.30. At 8.15, on the last morning of his life, Albert Weinshank has decided that his safety and his peace of mind are more important than $20,000 a year. Listen to this. Only 600 bucks. Four cylinder floating power. Freedom from vibration and rumble that makes driving a constant delight. Increased speed. Alex. And. Moran? Nah, it's too short. You know something, Paul? That's the sixth guy in there already. Nobody told us we gotta keep score. What we're supposed to do is count up to one. Morning, boys. Up ain't good old Riney. How's the eye business, Doc? Haven't you heard? I, uh, retired, living on my investments. <laughs> he means his old lady is paying the bills. Saw Pete's car out front. I thought I'd drop in, say hello, get a cup of coffee. Would you mind helping yourself, Doc? The waiter just left. Sure. How's it going, Pete? Okay. Say, the fella over at the barbershop gave me a tip on a freight from Miami. Indian broom. Long shot. Claims it's in the bag. I'll make my own mistakes. Okay by you? Sure, Pete, sure. Just thought I'd pass it along for what it's worth. You know? How's the weather out? Still coming down. Wind's like a handful of razor blades. <laughs> you guys are getting soft. Uh, Mr. Miller. It's uh, Mr. Bernstein, long distance from Detroit. Gabe, yeah, George, what's so important? What's keeping the guy? Bingo. Right height, right build, even the right clothes. That's our baby. I can let him have it right now. Ixnay, pal. We'll let him have it. If he comes out the door, go we'll call Vic. Go on.
Operator? Hey, give me Long Beach 6. Long Beach 6, 599. Right, right. Yeah, hello. He just stepped out. Any message? Yeah. Tell him his shirts is ready. Okay. What's that all about? Garlic! In case the bullets don't kill you, you die of the blood poison. The next time he tries to jack up the price at the last minute, I'd find somebody else up there to do business with. I had to stick a pineapple in his hat. Lousy cops. They sure picked a swell time to get nosy. Hell of a note if Cirilla shows up with the booze with them still in there. Let's get a cup of coffee. Yeah, I could use one. Okay, Mike. Quiet, Trench. George, is that you? Hello, boys. Uh, something I can do for you? Yeah, you can shut up. <laughs> I'll line up all of you. Face that wall. Uh, you, over there. Come on, move. No way. You two. All right, you two, let's go. Listen, Buster. You better be kidding. Move. How's he flat feet? Wait till you hear about this downtown. Move! Hey! You! You on the car! Let's go. Let's go. Sir, I'm just a mechanic here. Let's go. All I do is work on the automobiles. I don't know what you can do with these people. Come on. Move! Hands on a wall. Lean on it! The guy's telling me to get into the stock market, George. Pull up a few grand, and inside of you, you'll be a rich man. I say, what the hell? I'm already a rich man. And besides, I... Well, 
must have been a bad accident. Yeah. The way people drive today, you're Kenny. lucky. Hey, Kenny! The cops just killed a bunch of hoods in the garage up the street. One of them was Bugs Moran! Frank. Can you hear me, Frank? Who shot you, Frank? Who did it? Who shot you? Nobody. Nobody shot me. Your brother's dead. They're all dead. Come on, who did it? I've got to tell you, Frank. You're not going to make it. You want me to get a preacher? No. You just leave me alone. You don't want to let them get away with this? Come on, help us. It's cold. It's awful cold. Fix this thing, will you? A few hours after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, the newspapers managed to locate Moran, something the police have not yet been able to do. Just a heavy cold. Uh, I thought I'd better take care of it. Where were you, Mr. Moran, when it happened? I... <clears throat> out of town. How long do you expect to be laid up? Well, I can't say for sure. Uh, maybe a day or two. Did you know the cops are looking for you, Moran? Can't imagine why. <laughs> Nothing I can tell him. This gonna put you out of business? You must be a little mixed up, buddy. I happen to be in the real estate business. Oh, yeah, I, I knew some of those fellas. They, uh, just to talk to, you know. <laughs> I, I even read them and said they were working for me. <laughs> you can't believe everything you read in the newspapers. <laughs> Mr. Moran, there are a lot of people around town who are saying it was actually the police who killed your... those seven men. Do you think it's possible? You must be new around here, mister. Only Al Capone kills like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, make yourselves a drink. Now, you know, I'm always glad to have you people drop around. But believe me, this is one time I'd like to know the answers. Mr. Capone, I wonder if you saw those awful pictures of those men in the newspapers. <laughs> I glanced at them. Terrible. If you don't mind telling us, Mr. Capone, where were you when it happened? Why, right here in Miami. In fact, I was in a meeting with your district attorney that same morning. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know this Mr. George Moran personally? I met him once. A few years back. I doubt if I'd recognize him on the street. The Chicago authorities insist you were behind the, uh, massacre. Any comment on that, Mr. Capone? Well, I'm not surprised. They blamed everything on me since the Chicago fire. <laughs> Did you hear what Bugs Moran told the Chicago papers? He said only Al Capone kills like that. Yeah? Well, I'll tell you what Al Capone says. And you can quote me. They don't call that guy Bugs for nothing. <laughs> Public indignation at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre brings to a halt the most notorious era of open gang warfare in American history. Later in the century, the gangs will rebuild so that by the 1960s, their power will be far above that of the 20s. Once more, law enforcement agencies will be aware of the names of the syndicate leaders. And once more, they will not prosecute them, awaiting perhaps the moment when the public will demand, as it did in 1929, that the criminals be brought to justice. No one has ever brought to trial for the slaughter of the seven men in this garage. But within 19 months, all four of the killers will themselves die of violence. On the evening of May 7, 1929, 
John Scalisi and Albert Anselmi are invited to a banquet at the mansion of Al Capone, unaware that he has discovered their plot to murder him and take over his empire. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make a toast to my good friends, Giovanni Scalisi and Alberto and Salve. Salud. 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 Hey, you rot in hell! Of the two supposed police officers involved in the massacre, Boris Chapman is shot to death on January 5, 1930, while attempting to rob a St. Louis jewelry store. The body of Adolf Muller is found in a pond 12 miles south of Joplin, Missouri, on September 8, 1930. Vincenzo de Mora, alias Machine Gun Jack McGurn, is murdered in a Chicago bowling alley on February 15, 1936 almost exactly seven years after the St. Valentine's Day massacre he masterminded. George Clarence Moran disappears from Chicago soon after the mass murder of his followers. While serving a 10-year sentence for bank robbery in the federal penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas, he dies of lung cancer on February 25, 1957. Alphonse Capone, while he has never tried for complicity in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, his role as the man behind it goes unquestioned. Three months later, he is in prison, and more than half of the remaining 18 years of his life are spent in federal penitentiaries. On January 25, 1947, Alphonse Capone, his mind gone, his body ravaged by syphilis, dies in his sleep. On February 4, his body is interred in the family plot in the Chicago Cemetery. Welcome back. Now, to hit a couple of things that were a little off, you know, here in the second half. In the movie, we saw that Patsy was killed by Aiello. In real life, what really happened was Aiello tried to kill Johnny Torrio, the mentor, but failed. But it was a, that event was enough to spook Torio that he effectively retired and turned the operation over to Capone. And by the way, uh, 
Their gang in Chicago was kind of more formally called the Chicago Outfit. Now, what also is true is that Aiello did kill Lombardo, uh, who was the conciliary. Okay, so that's who was really killed. And that kind of explains why Patsy was kind of a composite character of the two. Something else that was off here in the picture was Capone did not kill Aiello himself on a train. What really happened was Capone's gunman killed Aiello, and that wasn't until about a year and a half later after these events. Uh, it was in October of 1930. Now, the massacre, so you know, the massacre, it occurred like what you saw here. It occurred in a garage at 2122 North Clark Street in Chicago. Now, that garage was torn down in 1967, same year as the film here. Uh, and that site, uh, they, they tore it down in order to have room for a parking lot for a nursing home. But the brick wall, uh, the bricks from that wall that the guys were lined up and shot against, the bricks were purchased by a Canadian businessman who for many years displayed them in various crime-related novelty exhibits. But as time went on, many of the bricks were sold individually, and the rest were <laughs> the rest are now on display at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, Las Vegas. <laughs> How appropriate. <laughs> now, something else here. In the final scene, we see where the camera is doing that zoom in on Capone's grave marker. That grave marker for the movie here Honestly, it was just a Hollywood prop. If you were to visit Capone's grave today, you would see that his real marker is this big, huge monstrosity. Tall. I mean, it, it dwarfs any of the other monuments around it. It is certainly befitting of the wealth that you would expect from the most infamous gangster in history. And uh, I, just so you know, too, uh, where he's buried now, he's buried now. His remains are now interred at Mount Carmel Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. Uh, it's kind of a western suburb of Chicago. And, well, I, I certainly hope that you have enjoyed Gangster Month. And, as always, I thank you for spending the evening with Full Moon Matinee. Stay with us as we continue our further investigations into the long-lost evidence of Hollywood. Until next time.